Welcome everybody and thank you for joining the latest Boutique Hotel News webinar. Today we're going to be uncovering what does Gen Z want from hotels? My name is Eloise Hansen. I'm the editor of hospitality here at Boutique Hotel News, your host for today. Um, and if you don't uh, know Boutique Hotel News, we're a trade publication covering the global boutique, lifestyle and luxury hotel industry. A quick overview of how today's session is going to run. We'll spend around 45 minutes uh, chatting with our panelists today, followed by some time at the end to take any questions from our audience members. So if you have any questions, please submit these using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Um, and I will get round to asking those where appropriate. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and everybody that has registered will receive a copy of that recording uh, within a couple of days time. So let's meet our speakers for today and I'm going to ask each to introduce themselves individually and I'm going to move from left to right as per your PowerPoint screens. So Alia, heading over to yourself first. Hi, uh, good morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Alia. I have the very, very fun job of leading design strategy for the lifestyle brands at Marriott. So what that means is we actually partner with, you know, our brand teams, our developers, but also the consumers. So Gen Z, you know, very big hot topic. And Gen Z or, you know, just sort of understanding who our travelers are today, what they're looking for and take all of that insight and package it into a design perspective. Um, I then hand that off to all of our partners all over the world. They are the architects and designers who actually build the hotels. So this is, you know, particularly a great uh, panel to be on because, you know, how do you translate conversations from one audience and bring them to brick and mortar into the hotels that people know and experience and what that looks like from a sort of process perspective? Well, there'll certainly be lots to learn today, Alia. Um, so very, um, very happy to have you here. Thank you. Simon, coming to you next, please. Welcome. Hey, good afternoon. Not quite as exotic as being in Washington, but good afternoon from Oxford, um, where I am in the process of going through a new opening of another product, um, having had several uh, several years of experience with new openings. Um, and I think the most important thing that I can lend to this discussion is looking at what I was doing with new openings and refurbishment 10 years ago and indeed 15 years ago, compared to how we're looking at orientating refurbishments um, and relaunches and new builds of products now on the demographics that we know are going to be utilizing them compared to those potentially, as I said, years ago. So I'm excited to chat with the rest of the guys on here, but also to talk about the journey that hotels have come on um, over the last decade um, in itself. Thanks, Simon. Um, Jan Oscar, over to yourself, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jan Oscar. I work at Cushman & Wakefield, which is a commercial real estate services company uh, specializing in hotels and sitting in the hotels department. Um, over the last two years, I've worked in brokerage and development, so a lot more on the side of the, the value of the assets and the trading of it. So hopefully I can lend an eye into that, that sphere. And then my second hat for today will be the fact that I've... Uh, recently confirmed my <laughs> status as a gen gen Z -er, um born in 97 so I sit on the cusp I've, I've been in denial for many years but I think this is the right right place to um to launch myself so looking forward to that oh well truly welcome to yourself uh great to have you here and um, last but very no means least Anastasia yeah good afternoon everyone I'm uh, Anastasia um, I'm a real estate investment and development analyst at Citizen M, focusing on the Europe and APEC region. Um, so I basically keep myself busy with all new acquisition and developments that we do. Uh, fun fact, actually, before starting at Citizen M, I was interning in the team that Jan Oscar is part of at uh, Cushman and Wakefield. Um, yeah, being a Gen Zer myself, very interesting to see what I can uh, uh, basically add today but also see like um, what the research says that uh, I find important uh, uh, so yeah very excited to be here thank you thank you Anastasia um, and quick note here that all the LinkedIn profiles of our speakers have been popped into the chat um, I do encourage you all to connect and learn some more 
Um, just to highlight some context before we get into today's conversation, here are some stories that we've published um, across boutique hotel news and service department news. Um, and I just want to focus on the middle story here, actually. Um, I think this is a great example of how hotels are launching new products um, specifically targeted at millennial and Gen Z travellers. So we've got Project HQ um, from Wyndham and SBE, which are launching, um, they've, they've called it a, a smart lifestyle brand. Um, and the brand name comes from the idea that hotels will serve as the headquarters for dining, nightlife and wellness. Um, so no doubt we're going to be learning a lot more uh, shortly. On the next slide, however, this is definitely the time to pull your pens and papers out because I'm going to be rattling off quite a few stats. Um, your left story here um, is a research paper by Pion, previously called Voxburner, who, um, which uncovered that there's 2 billion Gen Zs worldwide with the spending power of 44 billion. And when you factor in the influence that they have over their parents, that figure grows to $600 billion, uh, I should say, $600 billion. Within this report, 60% uh, of Gen Z income is disposable. 65% are inspired to buy things um, from social media. 74%, this is interesting, don't trust influencers to be honest about brands. And 95% say it's important that a brand cares about sustainability and protecting the environment. The middle story here, the state of student and youth travel in 2024. 58% plan to travel overseas in 2024. Over one third of Gen Z's prefer to spend money on experiences and physical products. 83% would consider taking a holiday that involved no alcohol at all. And 87% believe travel experiences increase employability. Your third screenshot is a poll that we ran on LinkedIn asking our followers, what do you think is the top priority for Gen Z travelers? And looking at these stats here, 39% believe affordability is the most important, uh, followed by experiential offering, followed by tech enabled. And then lastly, sustainability credentials here at 10%, which judging by one of these reports earlier that polled Gen Z travellers, 95% believed it's important that sustainability um, is 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 factored uh ranks highly with with brands um so i think there's a, a clear discrepancy there between what gen z's want and what maybe we think that they want um throwing it open does anybody want to comment on those poll uh those poll results before we dive in so i mean i'll jump in my yeah. first comment is i I completely and utterly can agree with this poll because I think there's there's a real um, there's a real notion that's potentially more of a no notion that's crafted in people that are are more senior in years to those in the Gen Z environment that sustainability is key, and I do think there was a a, a blip over the last sort of five to ten years of of how important sustainability is, but I think off the back of significant worldwide events like covid for example other elements have pushed themselves significantly to the top i've seen particularly from a hotel perspective that affordability and experiential offering has become significantly more important um to those age to those in that age group you know we have to remember this is an age group where more and more are unable to buy their own house more and more are having children later in life. So the disposable income is there, but they're more mindful of what they're going to spend that disposable mm -hmm. income on. So I'm not shocked to see affordability and experiential offering uh, coming higher out on that than where we potentially would have expected sustainability to be. Mm. Thanks, Simon. Jan Oscar, I can see your hand is up. Yeah, I think you know it's interesting to look at sustainability specifically and and the poll. And I think we're looking at you know top priorities. And I think that more and more the the assumption is that 
sustainability needs to be a baseline credential. And whereas you've got you've got parties and and specific groups within within both of the millennial and Gen Z generation that are you know extremely mindful. I think a majority are also just becoming you know mindful in general, um, and they will see it as as an important credential. But it's not the main reason of travel, um, mm-hmm. and I think I think that is quite important as well. I like that you said mindful. It sort of broadens the reach of what the representation is and whether it's brick and mortar or how you program or who we partner with and what the impact is on local areas. It it opens up the conversation a little bit more. And I love that because it challenges us all to look at what that represents a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Alia, as we're with you, let's kick off today's conversation. Um, let's talk about what does Gen Z want from hotels? Mwahaha. Alia, can you provide some insights into Gen Z traveller trends across Marriott's lifestyle portfolio? So, you know, it's it's a great time to be looking at this and looking at the world and listening to an audience, a very clear voice in an audience and understanding, like, what do we do with all of this? And You know, I think I'd start with the fact that Gen Z is definitely the audience. They're kind of, they scroll, right? They're not necessarily always posting, but they're scrolling. They're absorbing information. They are very, very drawn to visual medium. They are very drawn to understanding what goes then behind that photograph and digging into what that means for them personally, you know? there was a time when we would talk about how all our hotel guests wanted was that red rope culture, you know, the beautiful people walking into the beautiful lobby, having a cocktail in that, you know, signature bar and what that represented. And today it's a little bit less of that sort of red rope mentality and much more about, well, what are we doing here? How is this impactful? How does this impact me, the user, emotionally and culturally? But how does it impact a neighborhood? It's taken the transactional component of hotels and what that represents and put it to the side and said, but what are we doing for the, you know, the environment? What are we doing for the people who work here? What are we doing for the local? Why is what we're creating for our locals interesting? Um, You know, so that's one point of view. I think the second is common value. You know, people are gravitating towards shared values more and more are focused on wellness you know we spoke or we alluded to the fact that you know people have gone from I want to do tequila shots at the bar to I might like to have green juice or I might want to gather with a run club and go and explore the neighborhood with other people who like to be active and explore a city a little bit differently so I think that Gen Z has um, really inspired us to look beyond the obvious, find common value, create bonds or belonging that sort of transcends just, I'm going to hang out at the bar. I know I'm picking on bars today, but you know, the point of it is, I think they are asking us all to really look at experiences, understand what that means for a neighborhood and for a brand. Uh, you know, Taylor Swift was just in Tokyo and Mm -hmm. the Aloft uh, Ginza had a friendship bracelet making session in their hotel lobby for, you know, everyone to make their bands before they went to the contest, uh, to the concert. And, you know, this idea of belonging, you know, this is interesting to you. This is interesting to you. I'm going to give you a forum to do that. So, Really being able to take that and create belonging, ask the questions, uh, move past the sort of obvious of what luxury used to be into deeper meaning. Uh, And I think then the last one that I would sort of focus on a little bit is this idea that, you know, Gen Z, as you said, has the disposable income. Uh, they also have the flexibility. So they are working where they live and living where they work. And, you know, they're still traveling domestically and moving from hotel to hotel while working full professional lives, but they are no longer at their desks in their offices. And so what are we as experience makers doing to sort of speak to that? You know, what are we doing from a design perspective? How are we tailoring the room offerings? Where does technology play into Mm -hmm. that? So 
lots of big, you know, um, movements that have sort of started to uh, percolate as a result of their their needs, their genuine needs. Sounds like you could be very, very busy, if not now, Aliyah, definitely, definitely in the in the years to come. For sure. I think we all are differently, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Simon, um, can you talk to us about what you've noticed um, in terms of shifting Gen Z behaviours? You know, what's new, what's different? You know, I think... Been- I think I mean, if I could, if I could literally just say what she said and then draw a line under it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what? I mean, there's so, so many good things about what Ali has just said there, and I think you know it's it's about embracing that when you when you're doing when you're doing a hotel from scratch as as we are up in Oxford, it's about embracing that right from the beginning. It's tougher when you're doing a refurb to a certain degree if you've got an older building, and it's tougher if you're if you've already got a product that's that's in use that you you don't have the time or necessarily the finances to do a refurb or relaunch with, but there are so many little things you can do. Um, one of the key elements that we're certainly looking on is, is, and it's very apparent that we'll all see when we go out nowadays. I mean, we all go out nowadays with a laptop and we walk into we walk into a coffee shop, or we walk into a bar and it's filled with everybody under the age of 30, 35, tapping away furiously. Whereas these people, these people, you know, 15, 20 years ago w- would have been in offices in cubicles side by side or or in, in working in silo cubicle boxes. And, and all of a sudden now there's that community feel, which is incredibly important. And I think one of the aspects that we certainly looked forward for when we're designing this property and putting this property in is how much community space can we put in? How much co-working can we allow through that lobby space to make that food and beverage element co-working? And I think, you know, as we touched on before, uh, before we came on to the actual call here, I think COVID has had an automatic bounce push for that, even more so for that Gen Z generation. And we're seeing more and more people who, who were locked away at home for a year and a half, not able to communicate with anybody else except on Teams calls or Zoom calls such as this wanting to sit behind their laptop and actually be in an environment where they don't necessarily know the other people in the environment, but they've got that community feel because the person's opposite them or the person next to them is doing the same thing, quietly and happily tapping away on their laptop in a sort of coexisting community. And and I think it's really important for hotels to embrace that. And I think there are many properties out there nowadays that are rethinking their ground floor spaces. And there are many hotels Mm -hmm. out there that are rethinking their layouts for food and beverage. You know, gone are the days of grand ballrooms and grand huge restaurants with with conservatories and and bars after bars after bars you know because you know as Ali has touched on it's that day-to-day community and experience where people come in and try something a little bit different and share it with people that potentially could be friends by the end of the day with them or by the end of this meeting Um, Mm. and that that's key to us is finding that community feel which is something that certainly my generation um, and the in-between generation in between um, us and, and Gen Z have never really had before. Let me uh, bounce this one back to um, Alia then and, and ask, how are these changes influencing your approach to design, be that space programming, looking at the amenities, looking at the services? What... Think... Go on. Go ahead. No, finish your, finish your I was going to add, it, it, I'd finished anyway, over to you. <laughs> um, you know, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I think let's let's focus on health and wellness, for example. Uh, we've noticed or we've understood that, you know, Gen Z is very, very sort of focused on their well-being, whether they are home, they are on the road. Uh, there was a generation where you only ate well and slept well and exercised when you were at home and you were in your routine. And now when we are, you know, designing for a, a an audience that is constantly on the road. And, you know, it's like I said, they live where they work and they work where they live. Being well should not be the exception. It should be the norm no matter where you are. So take Western hotels, for example, you know, whether it's a focus on the sleep experience and how we tailor the rooms to better support some of that. There was a time when, you know, with some of our sister brands, the the bar was this massive uh, installation that came to life at 5 p.m. And now we're saying, you know, Simon, a little bit like what you were alluding to, they get up in the morning, they have a wholesome breakfast, they sit at the bar on their laptops. You know, the bar is the anchor, but the transitions during the day happen from what we do with design, what we do with product offering, what we do with experience. And all of it is always through the lens of wellness. Uh, people are jet lagged, they travel. Uh, what can we do from light and sound perspective to help to start to manage some of that? Um, people want to move. They want to move in 
beautiful fitness spaces that, you know, there was a time when a hotel gym, I call it the scary closet. It was in the basement. It was always near the back, you know, the, the, the fire escape. And now it really is about creating an opportunity where people can move comfortably within a hotel, state of the art partnerships, but, you know, Weston, again, takes that one step further and says, well, you know, you're in this beautiful location and we're outdoors. Why don't we create a run club and why don't we bring everybody along and show them the destination through the lens of wellness? So it's not just through perhaps some of our more traditional anchors like art and culture. Art and culture is important and certainly the hook for many of our brands, but again, through wellness. And this is all sort of driven from the voice of Gen Z. You know, how do we offer them these whole experiences that we have designed, uh, you know, gathering spaces, gathering spaces to actually have impromptu meetings, uh, places to be, I often say this, together alone, you know, you're in a lobby and it's bustling and it's active, but what is the little nook that you can sit in and take a conference call? or do a webinar like this, or how do we sort of tailor those experiences to be a little bit more expansive on that? So I think that's one component of it. I think the second component, and we just opened a hotel in Harlem in New York City, the Renaissance Hotel, and how do you become a platform for the neighborhood? So this is not just for the people who come to stay, you want them to come and stay, but you also want to show them the real neighborhood and not maybe the sort of synthetic fabricated version of what the neighborhood would be. And, you know, that's where I think programming and bringing in voices from the local area, whether they touch the food and beverage or they touch some of the content or the music or the partnerships. Um, you know, when we first opened that hotel, there was a lady who was showing some jewelry from uh uh, Harlem Fashion Week and you know hotel guests had an opportunity to see things that perhaps they might not have been able to see because they were there for one night on a business trip and leaving the next morning so how do you sort of start to merge meaning from the neighborhood and bring it into the hotel experience and really kind of push or open doors for people to experience more than just this is a place to shower and this is a place to sleep mm -hmm. Simon, I could see your hand popped up at one. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And particularly from a wellness perspective, I remember looking at refurbishments and new builds sort of 10 plus years ago. And, you know, a spa was a staple for a luxury lifestyle hotel. But a spa including wellness and well-being was not a staple at all. And, you know, the holistic the holistic aspects are so much more in demand nowadays than we've ever seen in any previous generation. And the idea of now, every time we're building or we're looking at a spa or a product that's got some sort of spa and wellness space, what is that space that's been giving over for mental and holistic well-being? What is that space where there'll be sound healing, crystal healing, et cetera? You know, and I, I having you know seen it in the last property in London before I came out to this one, from a from a property and a business perspective, incredible revenue generators you know incredibly great overheads incredible revenue generators with minimal outlay to set up from the beginning because there's a minimal amount of equipment that's required but really useful for driving revenue through and getting more of a pr exposure and if we're talking not just from a consumer perspective but the pr exposure it can do for the property in driving it forward and it's key for us you know we're looking at oxford the hotels in Oxford at the moment are, are old school, very well established, et cetera, and haven't necessarily got the space to be able to integrate that into it. So the benefit of doing a new build or a significant refurbishment, please always, if you get the chance, people, and you're doing that, put in some sort of well-being um, and holistic space because it's key and will significantly drive revenue. I'd like to bring uh, Janoska into the conversation here because we've talked about lots of different forms of experiential um, offerings. We, we've touched on co-working, we've touched, touched on wellness and well-being, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but do you see a relationship between these offerings of a boutique and lifestyle hotel with investor returns? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, to, to start off very simple, investor returns and value of an asset is, is driven by two, two key things. One is the cash flow that the asset makes, um, and and that's that's very clearly seen that experiential um, locations and offerings will drive higher ADRs. Um, 
it's not a new concept. Luxury has been doing it for, for a very long time. And we've been selling that to older generations and, and people are paying for a service. And now it's just been brought over to a lot more different asset classes. Um, and I think that you know, lifestyle is, is in its own asset class. It works within a lot of different asset classes and it's, it's becoming the, you know, the substitute option. Um, and, and across the board on the whole, you can see an increase in ADR. Um, and the positive thing in, in lifestyle and, and especially the lower brackets compared to luxury, because luxury brings a lot of extra costs to bring that service, that experience comes at a much lower cost. So you can drive ADRs with actually not increasing the cost as much, which increases your cash flow and, and boosts it up. Then you've got on the other other hand, you've got what, what we call yields or, or cap rates or your extra returns. And those are a, a li little bit more speculative and it's where the market sits for the value. So that's location based, um, but that's also you know, based off of off of the assets themselves and, and what's in them. And you know, we've seen two two different sales from from Hoxton's. One in one one sale, which is, would be in Paris and Amsterdam, which was at the back end of 2022 into 2023, um, and then now recently in London as well. Um, you know, that's that's starting to prove that there is significant significant value in lifestyle and boutique that's out there, and investors are are, are buying in, and parties like um, like APG are backing backing multiple um, different platforms. That, that are tapping into it. So it's it's definitely investable and I, and I do see um, an increase in investor return in the long run. And and, and on that note of, of APG, it, it's it's different forms of lifestyle, as you mentioned. It, it's often that sort of hybrid mix of, of short, medium and, and long stay, which goes to show that the, the understanding of lifestyle could potentially be expanded and maybe even evolve outside of city centers look at coastal coastal places look at sort of tertiary locations look at um lifestyle co-living properties in secondary markets uh, we might see more coming coming along um sticking with you Janowska, what trends or shifts have you observed in the preferences of investors regarding hotels that are specifically targeted to gen z consumers as in, as in trends, I think the most important thing is, um, is to understand the the demand pool for those assets, um, and they need to they need to be very clear. And I think that's what Lifestyle does very well at the moment. Is is it's it's a very good platform because it tells you it tells you exactly what your guests are coming for, um, and and there's a lot of, I think there's still a lot of hesitation in the market, um, on the investor side. And seeing seeing a concept and a brand that very clearly stipulates what it does and what the guests are that are coming there gives gives a certain level of comfort. Um, I think you know there's there's a big shift away from from brands that are a lot more generic. Uh, a couple of the let's say the older school brands, and I won't won't name them any to um, to risk to risk um, some some outrage from some from certain parties, but you know that a very generic brand in a generic location is really purely relying on its location to be to be its driver and like you were saying um you know assets that are slightly far farther away from city centers that that really make it a, a location that people want to stay in that they want to experience that that gives a lot more comfort to investors and that's a trend that that i think I'll, you'll see you'll see continuing um is it gives it gives some assurity towards who's staying at their assets and the, the longevity of it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jan Oscar. I want to um, change topic ever so slightly here. Um, I can see that there's a, a couple of questions um, from Craig Prentice. Hi, Craig. Um, focusing on, on hotel teams and, and staff members. And just last week, I hosted um, another webinar with, with Thevent in which it was highlighted that the greatest challenge that hotels continue to face is labour, the labour shortages within the industry. Um, so I want to put a positive spin on this and bring Anastasia into the conversation here and ask, what do you look for at, um, in an employer or a potential employer? What's attractive to you? 
Yeah, so for me, and if I may speak probably also for the wider Gen Z uh, generation, um, I think we look for an employer that uh, really aligns with our values and beliefs. Um, nowadays, I don't see uh, a job just as a, as a job. It's really an extension of who we are and a, and a reflection of what we believe in and stand for. Um, so uh, finding these type of things uh, back in your employer are really crucial. Um, and these can be different things. For example, looking at Gen Z, a big majority of us, we're either still studying or we're just starting our career. So having that um, opportunity to develop yourself, uh, for example, through different leadership programs or whichever way that may, that may be, um, is really key for us. But for example, also that has been already mentioned earlier by others as well. Um, for example, having that work-life balance. Um, I don't think Gen Z um, is living to work anymore, but work is more seen as something extra and um, and and not that and not that really as like a need in that kind of sense. Um, and this work-life balance can be in different ways, right? It can either be um, that you can work hybrid, but for example, also that. Uh, you know, you're more flexible in your working times if you're working, for example, from another country that you can start a bit earlier or later. Um, so I think these are things that we really look for and also value in an uh, employer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I follow this up? Um, I understand you, you obviously are working with a boutique lifestyle hotel brand, but that aside, and, and I suppose I'm talking to you personally here do you think that the industry the hospitality industry suffers from an image problem and what do you think we could do better to change this and maybe encourage younger team members to to join and, and work with us yeah so i think um in certain area yes um i think there are still a lot of um kind of how we almost said as well, quite some stuffy brands uh, within the hospitality industry that uh, younger people don't necessarily resonate with and where there are, for example, still a lot of restrictions that are not really part of, yeah, today's younger ge generation. For example, a lot of luxury brands still have this very... Um, they still don't want to have, for example, any visible tattoos, facial piercing, all those things. Even though when you look around... You see people every day with tattoos and, and all these types of things. So I think if brands really kind of um, hold on to these type of really old ways of thinking, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to attract a lot of uh, young talent. However, I do think um, the hospitality industry made quite some big steps in recent years, especially with a lot of uh, these new lifestyle brands coming um, uh, coming into the market and other types of cool brands that actually really embody this kind of more free-spirited um, type of people. And hopefully this is not only reflected towards the guests, but also towards the employees um, that they hire, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Anastasia. Uh, Jan Oscar, your hand is up. Over to you. I thought I'd, I'd jump in there as well. I think also, again, it's it's very dangerous to to categorize all of Gen Z together or all of that say that the new working force. Um, you know, I think what's what's extremely important is especially in hospitality, we've we've got a huge range of education and level of of commitment to work. Right? On on one end you might have somebody who truly, you know, works to live and have don't have huge desires to to become CEO at the end of the day. Um, and you've got to really cater to them when when you're looking at, at line line staff in hotels and you've really got to be able to make sure that you give them that ability to live alongside of work so that's where I think you know a lot of it comes down to hours of work and and scheduling and need to you know flexibility on that front and how you really incorporate them into the into that into the life and then and then you've got you know on the other end for example higher level of hospitality uh, education coming through from from ho hotel schools and mm -hmm. that there is there is a significant issue there that a lot of students that come from high levels of educational hospitality are leaving the direct hospitality industry uh, and I don't have a direct answer for it because um, I, I did did leave the direct line of operations um, but there's it's it's quite hard to attract um, 
that level of of student and and early worker um, back into back into hotel sometimes because the, there is that I think perceived image of of lack of a, a work life balance um, mm. and and if you're willing to put in the hours sometimes you feel like the the pay is an opportunity is better somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. I want to um, stick with the topic of uh, attracting Gen Z, but I'm going to flip it on its head now and, and focus on the consumer. Um, I can see that there's a, a couple of questions coming through from our audience all around marketing, trying to capture that that Gen Z user. Um, so I'm going to bring Simon back into the conversation here. Um, you mentioned that you're uh, soon to, to launch the store in Oxford. And I'm wondering how you are approaching your marketing strategy and whether you are tailoring that to the needs of Gen Z. Um, and I'll come up with some follow questions afterwards. So to begin with, marketing strategy, Simon. Sure. Well, I suppose from someone of my age, when my marketing manager walked in and said to me a couple of months ago, we're going to set up your TikTok account. And I sat there and looked at him panicked and said, I'm still getting to grips with Instagram. Do you really want to start off the TikTok conversation with me? And do you know what? I I think it was an it was an it's been an educational educational roller coaster for my generation in understanding the real power of social media. Um, and I think the most important factor that we have to take into account with Gen Z um, is, and you touched on it right at the beginning, Eloise, was there's a huge percentage of Gen Z out there that don't necessarily believe people that have got hundreds and thousands and millions of followers, because a lot of it's staged, a lot of it's paid for, a lot of it's put together. And those those micro influencers with sort of two, three, four, five, 10, 15,000 followers are having more power for our businesses than anything else, because there's those people that specialize in specific areas. And I was talking to a girl yesterday and she's got, you know, she's got 45,000 view, 45,000 followers on her Instagram. She only focuses on good food, good places and great service within 30 miles of her home. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's so much more relevant than me than having a Kardashian come and stay at the hotel and post whatever they've experienced, et cetera. So it's key to us that, people are believed with what they put together. We're looking to reach out and we're, we're working with a series of partners, which we did in my last property and we're looking for at the moment and, and we're, we're gaining a series of what we call ambassadors. And they are the type of people that would like our property. I think there's been a shift in marketing of, of looking for paid market marketing in magazines that doesn't necessarily hit every demographic that you want to, to looking for specifically tailored social media influences, whether it be TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, for, for those people that would actually like your property. So you want to find people that, you know, and as I said, we're looking at ambassadors, there's 10, 15 that we're looking at and we're talking to at the moment, and none of them have significant following. None of them are 50, 60, mm. 70,000 up to a million. None of them are that demographic. They're all that lower sort of 10, 20,000 follower because they have great reach for what they specifically do. So when people are searching for Oxford and searching for Oxford hotels, searching for dining in Oxford, and whether it be London or Oxford, find, finding that element of people who target exactly what you do and like exactly what you do and share with people who like what they like, that's, that's incredibly key for us. So I think we've had a massive step away from what I would call centralized advertising, you know, putting 20,000 aside for a double page spread in this magazine or that magazine. Um, as I've seen in the past, you know, when, 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 when a hotel's relaunched, it's, you know, how quickly can you get on the cover of this and how quickly can you get on the cover of that? It doesn't really matter anymore. Now it's all about how can I get onto someone's phone that's really going to enjoy it. And I've got seven, eight, nine seconds for them to pick it up and think that's unique. And I want to be part of it. You know, the whole traveling, you know, Gen Z traveling nowadays, it's it's about the experiences. We talked right at the beginning about money and income and affordability. Um, this is a generation that are buying houses later because houses are crazy expensive nowadays compared to the previous two generations. This is a generation that have more disposable income because they're having children later. They're still living at home. They're potentially sharing on rent with others as opposed to buying their own or renting outright. But that affordability is key to them. You know, the value is key to them and what they can spend their money on. So for us, it's about finding those micro influences that go out to people that are specifically looking for great quality food in the area, 
and has something different to it, whether it be, as we talked about earlier on, non-alcoholic drinks, specific artisan food, et cetera, and build in the experiences. I would rather be working with, as we are, you know, we've got a partner in, in a small coffee company locally to us. Their story behind it is they set up in Oxford, New Ground Coffee, they're called, they set up in Oxford. Um, and every year they go into, the, every month, sorry, they go into the Oxford prison and they train some of the inmates to be full-time baristas when they come out and then they bring them into the business and that that media link from us for PR is more important than me necessarily doing a double page spread in a Southeast Asian magazine for the hotel in the future. I think it certainly speaks to the fact that travellers now are more discerning. I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier. I think it was Alia who mentioned about what what is it that goes on behind the photo. Um, I think that's maybe the true story as opposed to what you are visually seeing in in front of you um and i'm i'm a millennial so I, I i can't comment too much on on the gen z stuff but looking at how my friends engage with social media platforms and the people that they follow it is it is very tailored they they won't go for the it's it's quality over quantity perhaps um totally. and i and I look at how they also research their um, travel inspirations. And it's often it's recommendations, natural sort of word of mouth, even if that is through a influencer, but that has a very, they've carved out a, a very specific space on social media um, oh, where so. they, where they um, sort of, you know, you look, you look, you look at Eloise, there are certain very well-known restaurants and there's one that obviously started in the Middle East and has now got an outpost in London. And it's all about how you're sprinkling salt onto a piece of meat at the end of the day and then paying £20,000 for a gold leaf burger. But how many people are actually connecting with that? Sure, there'll be millions of followers, but how many of those followers are actually translating into revenue? What we're looking for is people that look at it and go, you know what, that looks great and it's affordable. It's not out of my reach. And the phrase affordable luxury has been termed and coined by so many different brands and so many different establishments. But but I think, you know, when we talked, when we looked at setting this up and the first question from, from our chefs were, are we looking for a Michelin star? Are we looking for the best of this or the best of that? Actually, no, I'm not. I've done, I've been through that process. And, you know, in many cases, having a Michelin star just puts another hook around your neck of what you've got to adhere to the whole time. Something that is, of, of not just affordable to all but accessible to all and mm. is publicized and marketed as accessible to all has definitely surely got to be bene beneficial to all of us in this industry in the future mm -hmm. and I think there's something around like deeper meaning and you know Simon you and I have only just met and I feel like now anytime I travel I'm going to ask you for recommendations because there are things that you were saying that resonate with me and you know certainly they may not res resonate with every consumer but finding that common value, that priority, how people look at the world, like those are the true influencers, right? And, you know, what have they discerned? And if it does, in fact, inspire something within me, how does that take me down a specific path versus, as you said, the two page spread, you know, in People magazine? Totally. I, you know, I think we look at things and for how many years have all of us in, in hotels been thinking, gosh, one of those Achilles heels of food and beverage. How do we get it to work? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we make sure we generate food and beverage without having Heston or Gordon stood behind the hot plate shouting and screaming at people to get that buzz and get that marketing? You know what? You come full circle and you think to yourself, actually, I know I'm not going to keep them in the building every single night. And that's fine. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give them some great recommendations of where my team in the building would go out to eat and drink locally. Because it's not logical to think the moment these people choose to come and stay with us, they're captured. They're coming to the new city for the first time. They're going to be in sores, locked behind the front door, and they're never going to go out again. That's ludicrous to think that. And too many times in the past, hotels have bashed through marketing and PR plans for restaurants and bars. No, they're going to go out and facilitate them going out. And the chances are, if something great and vibrant is happening in the hotel when they get back in, do you know what? They're going to come back in and have a drink in the evening. We've got a fantastic product in Paris called Hotel Dam des Arts. It opened in July last year. It's had great press wherever you look. One of the best openings in the world, according to Condé Nast, et cetera. But the ethos of there's stuff going on. It's part of community. I can get into that. Going out for dinner, having a fantastic experience out in Paris, and then at 10, 11 o'clock at night, walking back in the door, and there's a DJ, and there's a buzz in the lobby, and there's, there's some crazy people 
dancing with pythons and anacondas in the bar area and you think <laughs> what is going on I kind of want to be part of it not just from a social media perspective but it's stuff that I wouldn't expect and it's not publicized so give them those experiences but don't think that you're going to keep them behind the doors and staying in every single night having your food and beverage speaking of uh dancing with anacondas and stuff it, it i i immediately my mind went to studio 54 not that ever anacondas were involved there but i do wonder is there scope for something like that to be um reimagined and and brought back but maybe maybe that uh club had its had its heyday i think i think we tried I mean, to do we tried to do that at the mandrake didn't we to a certain degree <laughs> i'd say the today version of that is goat yoga we had a very long conversation in the office about goat yoga the other day and there was a part of me that was like huh okay we went from you know getting in line for studio 54 or certainly when the mandrake opened trying to find our way right to the sort of center of it all to goat yoga but it's real and values have changed and That's you know it. i love it i love that it keeps us all on our toes it's all about experiences you don't you don't know and experiences that you don't expect you know the other property we've got in Paris is called uh, Hotel de Grand Voyageur. You go to the toilet and whilst you're in the toilet, you walk out the toilet and there's a door next to you and suddenly it opens, but it's not a door. It's just a mahogany wall that you don't realise a door. And it's an old school speakeasy. And it's great to see them coming back again. There are so many properties now that are putting quirky elements in like that, where it's an experience you don't know. It's not publicised. There's not a huge deal of marketing. You go there and all of a sudden, you know, you're walking through the side of a toilet door and you're in a private drinking area or a speakeasy in a hotel and you think gosh I need to tell people about this that's mm. the perfect element of marketing and PR mm. nowadays you know the power of sharing things on social media is great but the power of people talking to other people and going you have to go there for that specific element you know it goes mm. through our food and beverage you know we're, we're listing up in Oxford our food and beverage under under something listed as untraditionally British. What the heck is untraditionally British, people say? It's taking British elements and putting a twist on it. So if I say to you, we're going to do a pie and mash, no, we're not just going to do a pie and mash. You'll think it's pie and mash, but all of a sudden it's a chicken makhani pie with gunpowder potatoes and rusty vegetables. And that's not what I'm expecting on the plate. And that's what people don't expect. You know, we're taking, one of my guys today said to me, later on today, gut boss, we want you to try deep fried lasagna goujons. I was like, what? And he goes, we're making lasagna, but we're going to deep fry it in goujons with this sauce and that sauce, because we're taking a dish that people understand, which is lasagna, and we're just doing something different with it. But we're not going to massively publicize it because we want mm. people to come in, experience it. And that's when they will share it and go, you need to go there just for this. Mm -hmm. And that Sign to me, me it's more tangible. <laughs> Jan Oscar, your hand is up. Over to you. Yeah, I think you know, it's very interesting to look back at, you know, niches and, and seeing all of these things that become you know true experiences and I think gone are the days of I need a cookie cutter concept that I'm I'm sticking down and that is also ex really seen in in the inv investment world and whereas before you would look at an old building and go my god this is going to be a nightmare um, I've got a bunch of space that doesn't work got you know the all these small corners and and nooks and and i can't i can't run a proper big restaurant out of it but actually what you're seeing now is lifestyle is giving new life to a lot of old buildings that yeah. were not that it just didn't stack up before and now you actually can put a concept in that has all of these amazing nooks and has you know really works with the building that's that's been given to them and and looking at it with from a fresh template and that's that's what's driving also just a lot of value at the moment is is the ability to just look at completely new assets that weren't able to to be used before. Stick, stick just one moment, Elia. I just want to stay with um, Jan Oscar for one moment. Um, I've often heard the phrase "follow the money," right? So, with that in mind, how do you see the lifestyle product evolving? Um, being that what in what in investors are now attracted to, or be that driven by Gen Z demands needs. And the rest. Yeah, so I think you so you've always got the concept of follow the money, and then the money comes comes from the de, from the demand. So however however much I sit removed from from the everyday consumer, I you still need to think about it. And you know we've been spending a lot of time talking about how we're marketing towards people, and and historically I think you know, word of mouth mouth has always been the strongest way of of getting people in through the door per recommendation. Whereas you know when when the internet first came out everyone was like wow we can reach the masses we can we can hit everyone across across a platform and now we've got algorithms that are so strong 
that you can find micro influencers that you believe and trust because it feels like they are friends. So you suddenly you can use word of mouth mouth on um, you know, on the internet. And that's that's what we're, we're, we're seeing now. And that means that you can really pinpoint niches in travel. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think Gen Z might, might well be next to millennial, one of the most divided generations um, with, with so many different, you know, needs and demands and reason for travel. And, you know, look at Accor right now, they've, they've got over 40 brands and that's increasing. And a lot of those are lifestyle. And so, you know, they're catering to, you know, to budget, they're catering to mid-scale, they're catering to upper upscale, the catering to upscale, they're even, you know, reaching into the smart luxury se sectors. So I think the way it's going to develop is that we are going to find all of those niches. And the question is, you know, how scalable is it? Mm. Um, and, and that's, that's a big question to to put out there i think hoxham has been a great example of of scalability um but maybe there's also a lot more there in the boutique world that you know actually there is there is just a small niche that works extremely well that doesn't need a huge brand and and we're i think we're just going to see a lot of that variation um and i think it's important to remember that it's it is all these small little micro groups that travel now oh yeah your hand was up I, I was actually going to pile on to Jan Asker's comment about like opportunity in real estate. You know, there was a time when um, every hotel room needed a window. And then, you know, we got this deal in Nashville for a moxie and there were a few rooms with no windows. And there was a generation where no windows, how no one's staying in that versus looking at the opportunity to understand that given who the guest is, they're going to the Johnny Cash Museum. It is a very loud uh, music street. Uh, these guests often have late nights and then all they want to do is sleep. So how do you take that opportunity of the no windows and cocoon them and make them feel really comfortable and offer them something that speaks to what their needs are? And so I think just, you know, what Gen Z has done is I think challenged us to look at the problem a little bit differently and find the opportunity instead of I'm not doing this to what could I do? And I think it touches every component, whether it's the built environment, the programming, the experience, all of it. And, you know, I love that it challenges us in that particular way. Mm -hmm. I want to um, bring Anastasia back into back into the convo here. Um, something that we haven't we, we touched on at the beginning is around sustainability um, and in ESG and and the the difference between what Gen Z's actually want compared to what we think that they want. Um, so I'm going to go straight to the horse's mouth. As somebody who is maybe representing some of Gen Z's, but Anastasia, does um, do you expect brands to uphold certain commitments in this? And I'll, and I'll broaden it. It doesn't necessarily have to just be sustainability. It could be diversity, inclusion, accessibility. Um, what what Simon mentioned about you know um, brands that are uh, supporting um, disadvantaged communities and upskilling, um, I think it was prisoners you mentioned that they were training mm -hmm. to become baristas. But Anastasia, what are your thoughts on this? How do you what do you look for in terms of a a, a brand in term, and what you buy from them? Yeah, definitely. I think especially certain things that you just mentioned, especially, for example, sustainability, but also diversity, for example. Um, those are things that I almost expect brands to nowadays do something with. Like for me, it's weird if actually a brand hasn't looked at any sustainability strategies or hasn't really involved themselves in, um, in being diverse in that kind of sense. Um, however, I think um, something else that we mentioned before as well is how far well where does where does it rank on my priority list and am i willing to pay a really big premium for mm -hmm. those things i have to say no also considering that i think um if i have two quite similar options um, in terms of price but for example one um, is super sustainable yes of course i will go for the sustainable option however if they um 
if the premium is that much higher for me to pay, um, then there's a bit more of a big question mark if I would go for it or not, actually. Mm -hmm. I, well, that definitely speaks to um, our, our poll earlier and that perhaps affordability does rank higher in terms of, of, of priority lists. Um, sticking with you, Anastasia, um, there's been a couple of comments from the audience. There is absolutely no way I'm going to get through all these questions, but thank you all for, for sending them in. Um, do you think that brands should try and segment and attract just solely a Gen Z traveller, or do you think brands should try and appeal to the wider market? Um, I think um, I don't really see, I think um, because right now we're kind of really singling out um, Gen Z and very specific needs that Gen Z has. However, these needs you can also see back in different generations as well. Um, mm -hmm. So I think really solely focusing on a very niche um, Gen Z group um, isn't really uh, maybe the best strategy because I think, for example, there are, there are also millennials or even Gen X, whoever, um, who will um, appeal to, for example, that niche as well. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think it's also very difficult to maybe really single out only people from that specific group and from that specific age group. Um, because if others, if there are others that resonate with the same type of beliefs and values, why wouldn't you want to target those as well? Um, mm -hmm. In the end, if you want to focus on wellness um, and very maybe specific ty types of wellness, someone earlier mentioned like crystal healing, um, yeah, it can be anyone from 25 to 55. It doesn't really matter, I think, in that, uh, in that kind of sense. Mm -hmm. We are very closely coming up to three o'clock um, UK time, I should add there, because I know we're all calling in from around the world today. Um, want to tie Anastasia's answer into a final question to you all, actually, given everything that we've we've touched on today. Um, and this was a comment um, from Andrew Thompson. Hi, Andrew. Um, I'm Gen X and listening to this and think that everything applies to me. Does everyone on the panel really believe that Gen Z is demanding something that is substantially different to Gen X and Gen Y? Um, but the question I want to ask you all is, what do you think are the key differences between Gen Z and perhaps the other generations? I will kick off with um, Alia first, and then I'll come to Simon, Anastasia and Jan Oscar. I think what Gen Z is asking for is, you know, it's asking a question around meaning and belonging. And I think, as you said, quality. And I think those sentiments are sentiments that relate to anyone, you know, a sort of thinking audience. I think perhaps where you might see differentials will be in things like technology and, you know, comfort around adopting technology and what that might respect, what that might, you know, be from a physical impact, you know, super simple example. I travel with my parents, they struggle with technology, but they relate to so many other things around wellness and inclusion and, you know, ease and the lack of formality in many of our, you know, differed brands today. But so I think there's certain things around, you know, technology or accessibility that I think could be very different as you move from sort of segment to segment. But I do believe that, you know, particularly Simon, you talked about this earlier with things like COVID, everyone was sort of forced to re-question value systems. And I think that that re-questioning means different things for different people. And I think it sort of had us all thinking about what we want from hotels and travel and, you know, work-life balance differently. And I think that transcends a generation uh, in a meaningful way. Simon, what do you think are the key differences between Gen Z and the rest? So I think, I think first of all, it, it's, it's their understanding of certain words and phrases. Let me explain that. Gen Z studies show are the most stressed and depressed generation ever in existence at the moment. And you have to ask the question, well, are they or 
are they because they actually understand what those words mean? You know, I can remember years and years ago coming home and saying to people, oh, God, I'm stressed. And the response would be, pull yourself together. I'm depressed. All right, well, go for a walk kind of thing. And that, that was the old school sort of millennial all the way back mm. to, to Gen Y and previous kind of response to everything like that. I think particularly, and again, as, as Ali has just touched off the back of COVID, everyone now is so much more understanding of how important mental well-being and mental health is. And as businesses, you know, harping back to what, what makes it more appealing to get people into the industry, as businesses, we need to be mindful of actually working working 80 hours a week 90 hours a week isn't necessarily the way to get the best out of people you know mm. gone are the days gone are the days of work longer hours and be more productive really did, did that ever really produce anything that w- we should have been doing and I think now we have a generation of people that fully understand the benefit of what needs to be done in those working hours but also having a work-life balance now is more important to this generation than any generation we've ever seen in the past and as employers We've got to be mindful of that. What are we allowing people to do in their spare time? Because it's not necessarily about how much you're going to pay me now. It's it's about actually, can I get a couple of hours later to come to work? Or if I come to work, am I going to be able to use the facilities? I remember working in hotels 15, 20 years ago. And if you said to the to the hotel manager, can I use the pool for a swim before I start work? The response would be, are you out of your mind? You can't be seen in a guest area. Actually, do you know what? We went through a scenario in my last property where actually, yes, guys, if you want to use this, go for, go for a swim before you start work, that's fine. I don't have a problem, as we did in the past of, you know, the restaurant manager happens to be in the pool with somebody that they're going to be serving dinner to in two, three hours time. That's not such a bad thing because the relationships that can be built between mm-hmm. team members and people and regular customers and consumers going in are way more powerful than anything else you could potentially do from a business or, or whatever you would spend money on. People do business with people they like. How do you get them to like them? You get them to build relationships with people. Thanks, Simon. Coming to Anastasia next. Yeah, I agree with both what Simon and Ali already said. And yeah, I think the main thing here is that, uh, for example, for example, tying into the work-life balance, I think both, for example, Gen Z and Gen X are looking for work-life balance, but probably in different ways where maybe... Uh, a Gen X, even though this might be a bit like stereotypical, is looking for a uh, work-life uh, balance in terms of being able to pick up the kids from school, whereas a Gen Zer is looking for work-life balance where they can go on holiday for three weeks and work um, from where wherever they are located mm. in, in the world, right? So I think that is one part. And then I think another part is also like how to, um, even though they might be looking for similar things, the way you target the different ge- ge- the different generations, um, might be different where you target Gen Z most likely through social media platforms like TikTok but if you want to appeal uh, to someone from another generation for the same um, for the same crystal healing you don't do this via TikTok but you choose another way um, mm-hmm. and I think those are kind of the differences that are important to understand but also to understand like yeah where the different the different generations sit and where and what of the different kind of topics they find important. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Anastasia. And Janoska, your final thoughts? Again, ditto. I think I agree with everyone about, uh, before. I I think that it, it comes down to you know, very, very specialist opinions and desires and wants. And with that comes hyper awareness from the guests. So I think anything that falls out of line with the general feel of, of what they're looking for really, really irks them and jars them very quickly. So it's it's about a space completely buying into um, into their concept and not not being generalists and and being able to to really focus on that on that specialist group and making sure that a hundred percent ties into that. Thank you, thank you all so much for your um, opinions and insights today. We have had so much engagement from the audience, which can only be a great sign. And I'm going to flag here that we'll keep our webinar open for an extra two minutes. Um, right at the end so that our audience members can follow up on any of the links that we've popped into the chat including our LinkedIn uh, profiles of our speakers here so if we didn't get round to asking your questions I suggest you get straight over to LinkedIn and ask them directly yourself. Um, just want to flag our next webinar um, we've partnered with Agilisys um, 
to host a webinar on empowering staff with technology to deliver exceptional guest experiences. And that will be taking place on Thursday, the 29th of February. We would love to see you there. Um, and the link to register has been popped into the chat. If you're interested in working with us, do get in touch with my colleagues, Rav or Piers. Their details are up on your screens and also their contact details have been popped into the chat for you. And all that is left for me to do today is say thank you to Jan Oscar, to Anastasia, to Simon, to Alia. I um, really appreciate your time. I know we've slightly overrun, um, but enjoy the rest of your days. Really enjoyed this discussion and I look forward to seeing you on the 29th of February. Take care, team. Bye bye.